try that. All right. Uh, my name is Joe Heff, as I already mentioned, and we are talking ab about Bundler, probably a gem that all of you are using every day. I'm going to assume that, because you should be. Um, so what uh, the challenge is here today is to teach you something new, right? What don't you know about Bundler? Uh, so hopefully each of you will walk away with something new that you didn't know at the start of the talk. Um, so, let's see, I might not even be able to get this large enough. Nope, it's not wanting to increase here. So, quick start guide to Bundler, right, is that you install the gem just like you would uh, normal gems, or at least back in the day, you would install just a, a gem right into your kind of system level gem set, right? You guys are probably using RBEMV or RBM, something that's managing your Ruby versions. Uh, sometimes Bundler is automatically installed for you, um, since it is kind of ubiquitous now. Um, Pretty much every gem that you see, every Rails app you see is going to have a gem file, right? And I guess we can start with what is gem bundler, right? The whole idea is managing application dependencies. So most likely uh, you are using tens or twenties or hundred other open source gems at all varying different version levels. Some play nicely with others and some don't. Um, bundler is a very complicated gem that figures out all of that dependency tree for you. So if Gem need, if some, if Rails needs a certain version of active support and active support needs a certain version of whatever it might need, uh, Bundler has all the logic and smarts to figure out what versions work with what versions, right? Um, so uh, it does a, a lot of heavy lifting that we used to have to do, which is, which is really great. Um, the other part is that it gives you is not only dependency management, but kind of scope management as well. So if you remember back in the day, you would install gems onto your system, essentially, right? Kind of as root or pseudo, they go into your system level gem set. Uh, and that would be the same version that you would use across all projects. And if you had projects using different gems, you would have to install or possibly uninstall different versions so that they wouldn't conflict with one another. Um, so Bundler came to the rescue and said, hey, let's, let's give you a nice, clean environment that only has your dependencies, only the gems you care about and nothing else. Um, so that's kind of an overview, which uh, probably many of you knew already. But um, So the Bundler, Bundler you still install kind of as that root level gem, and then uh, it takes over from there. So the first command right out of the box is bundle init. That's the quickest way to create a gem file. Um, that actually took me a while to figure out a few years ago that, uh, hey, I don't know how to write a gem file. Why don't I just hit bundle init? And it gives you a nice, clean, blank file. Um, let me do that somewhere else. Actually, you know what, I won't. It, just, uh, it gives you a clean gem file and uh, my example here is that you would open up that gem file, you would add a gem to that list, so say Sinatra, and then you would run the famous bundle install. That's probably what everybody is used to running most days. Um, it will go through and figure out your dependencies and install them on your system. Somewhere, somewhere magic, right? Uh, a quick check to see if all of your dependencies are met is the bundle check command. Um, and then finally, if you want to see all of the gems that are included in your in your bundle file, uh, you would run bundle list, right? So those are probably four quick commands you guys are all familiar with. Um, so moving on from there, uh, I guess we'll talk about the lock file. So uh, let's take a look, actually we'll take a look at a gem file right now um, and kind of talk through it a little bit. So your gem file at the top, almost all of yours are going to say, hey, my source is Ruby gems. That's the gold standard for, for gems. So that's what we want to tell Bundler about. Um, you can optionally specify the version of Ruby that you're using. Um, so this will lock you into uh, to that version and it'll warn you if you're not using it. Um, from there, you guys have seen these before, but we'll kind of talk about some of the uh, options in your gem file. So uh, a gem with no version means it's going to go out and get the latest, whatever that might be. Um, you can then scope per version, right? I want anything greater than 1.0. Uh, you can do your tilde greater than, which gets every any minor version um, within 1.0.0. .0 .0. 
Uh, you can specify exact versions of your gems. And as far as best practices, I would specify either exact versions for your gems or at, I guess at the very loosest um, or least, kind of the, uh, the patch level gem. Um, one thing that you can do with gems is not all gems are named the same as their actual include file. So you have this optional uh, require flag out here that says, no, really the file is called graph viz.rb, not rubygraphviz.rb. Um, so some, some deep tricks you can do here with GitHub. So it understands full Git paths uh, and really kind of any protocol, insecure or secure uh, GitHub paths. Um, you can do the shorthand GitHub uh, as well. So you just enter in the repository name and the, and the gem. Uh, you can op optionally pass in a very a specific branch uh, rep or tag that you want to load. Um, so that's all built in. Uh, one thing I learned recently is that there's actually a Bitbucket version of this as well. Um, so if there are gems like MailChimp posted out on Bitbucket and you want the latest, uh, Bundler knows about that as well. Um, cool trick that I didn't know about that I learned recently here is you can define your own endpoints. So let's say you have an internal stash uh, a local stash server where you are hosting gems or source code, uh, you can actually dynamically define your own source endpoints right here in your gem file, giving it the path to that repo uh, or kind of an an anonymous block to your, to your gem server essentially, um, or I guess git server. Um, and then this would work. You could say, hey, I want to get my fork of rails off of my local stash server. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, let's see here, uh, local development. If you guys are locally developing your own gems and you want to use that in your project, you don't want to have to push it to GitHub, uh, you can run a gem straight off your file system. So Path does that. Uh, if you're running your own gem server somewhere, uh, you can actually point it straight to that. Some people will have an in-house in gem server that they don't trust Ruby gems for. Uh, you can actually specify a source on where to go get it from. Uh, gem in a box would be that gem if you want to run your own gem server. Um, let's see here. Uh, groups. So Bundler and your gem file support the concept of groups. Uh, as developers, we have a lot of developer tools and testing tools that we don't want deployed into a production or staging environment. So you would put all of those gems, you would scope them to your particular group. Um, and as we'll see in a bit, you can install gems with or without groupings. Um, so this is kind of the rundown. I wanted to kind of give a sample of a lot of different things that you can do in a gem file. Um, oh, one other thing I forgot to cover right here is require false. So by default, when you, when you load up your application or run a script, Bundler is going to load all of these gems and require all of these gems. Um, so if there are certain gems you don't want to require at runtime or might be really slow to require just on an application load, say like in RSpec or something, Factory Girl might be slow to load, you would say, hey, I don't want to load Factory Girl. I'll do that manually only when I'm running specs. So require false will keep it out of the load path, essentially. Um, let's go look at what the gem file lock looks like for this guy. Um, Again, you guys have probably looked at this, but we're kind of just doing an, an anatomy of a gem file here. So your lock file is what locks everything in. Um, it's going to define the versions that you have installed, whether you, or not you have those versions specified here, uh, or specify the exact versions if you're doing one of these uh, kind of greater than or equal to things. Um, so you'll see at the top, you'll get a lot of your Git repos that are either connected to branches or revisions. Um, and then the cool thing that I find is you see dependencies here, right? What, what does this gem depend on? Um, so you'll see uh, gems that are not in your gem file get installed, right? You might have 10 gems in your gem file, but 50 gems got installed because it's pulling in all those extra dependencies. And you'll see all of these gems and what they're scoped to. Uh, this is a very fragile file. You don't want to manually edit this really, or often, or maybe ever, because uh, Bundler is using this to get your system into the right state. Oh, man. What did I do? There we go. Okay. Uh, so here you can just see, here's all the gems that got loaded, or, or that will be loaded, their exact versions. 
Um, the list goes on and on. Um, I'm on the Ruby platform. This platform can change if you're on JRuby or some other implementation of Ruby. Um, and then again, it kind of just has a list of new dependencies. I've specified my Ruby version, and oh hey, this is the version of Bundler that was used. So, kind of a brief overview of, of gemfile and gemfile.lock. Um, so, what happens next? We want to run some files, right? So your friend with Bundler, your first command is bundle exec. Um, so, if you were to run a Ruby script just without bundle exec, you would get whatever your system environment is. Bundle exec is the thing that loads the gem file, loads all your dependencies, and gives you that nice clean environment. So you're going to say bundle exec Ruby, you know, some script, or bundle exec rake in some task. Um, if you get tired of typing bundle exec, uh, you can throw at the top of any script these two special requires require Ruby gems and then require bundler setup. Uh, this will cause the load of your bundle environment, and then you can just run Ruby my script because you've essentially told it to load the bundle environment before running your script. Um, one environment variable just to be aware of is your bundler gem file. When you run a script, this is an environment variable that gets set with the full path to your gem file. Um, so there are env environment variables at play with gem bundler. Um, there's also a nice handy install step here uh, for bin stub. So if you want binaries to come along with some of your gems, uh, our spec would be uh, a, a default or a typical one. Instead of always running bundle as exec R spec all the time, it's uh, shorter to just type bin R spec. So installing your bin stubs will create a local bin folder and put all of your binary scripts there uh, that essentially, all, you know, always load bundler first and then. Uh, will we'll be scoped to your environment. So that's kind of, again, intro path. You guys are probably all aware of bundle exec, um, but that's probably a, a most often missed thing as well. Um, the next three commands that are some of my favorite, list, show, and open. So all of these are bundle list, bundle show, bundle open. Um, bundle list, as I mentioned earlier, will list out, uh, I guess I need to make this a lot bigger. Look here. So bundle list lists out all your gems in their version, right? You can sometimes just list through that and grep for a gem that you might be interested in. Let's say I'm interested in uh, rack. Where is that? So this is going to show you where on your file system this gem is installed. Um, this can be super helpful just to know where things are. Um, uh, but then my favorite is bundle open, uh, which is really helpful. Let's say uh, you're trying to debug somebody's third-party code. I was just deep in the bowels of like devise and warden the other day. Um, I wanted to put some pry statements in there to debug it, and so the easiest thing to do is to open up that thing in your editor. Um, so what this will do is will it will open up that rack 1.6.4 folder, uh, hopefully somewhere. Maybe Adam's being a little slow here. Uh, so it opened up my Atom editor with this gem, and now I can get I can get down into this guy's lib folder, and I can look at its auth stack, and I can say, hey, I want to put a a pry statement right here and initialize, because that's where I want to see what's going on, right? So, um, so this has been extremely helpful. If you want to look at other gems, you don't have to go out to GitHub, you don't have to clone any gem just to look at its source. You can just bundle open straight from where you are. Um, and start walking through that code. You can look at structure. You can, you know, it's a great way to learn about other gems. Um, so let's see here. So bundle list, show, and open are three common use tools I commonly use. Um, the way to set your editor is through a bundler editor environment variable. Uh, you can also use just the regular dollar editor environment variable as well. Um, so I have mine set to Adam W, or you could set it to Sublime W. Um, and that's why that gem just opened up in, uh, in Adam for me. Uh, let's see here. So as your project moves along, you guys are probably updating gems, adding new gems, removing gems that you don't need anymore as you're going through versions. Um, a really neat tool to figure out outdated versions is actually a command called bundle outdated. Um, so you run this against your gem file. It could take a little while if you have a lot of gems. Um, and it will go through and scan um, 
gems that you have specified and gems that are installed and figure out which ones you don't need anymore. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking about something else here. Uh, bundle out data is going to show you all the gems that need to be upgraded. So uh, you, if you're stuck on something old or you're using kind of a greater than or less than or greater than or equal to type thing, it will go through and show you all of your gems that are outdated. Um, so it'll show you, you can see here the newest uh, versions here on the left, what you have installed if they're in a particular group. This one shows a, uh, an actual Git shell. So it's the same version of this dynamic CRM gem, but there's a new SHA out there, so it knows to go look at, uh, at your GitHub repos as well. Um, so from with bundle outdated, you probably want to update some gems. So our next command here is bundle update. Um, it is probably very bad or poor uh, idea to just run bundle update for your entire gem list, unless it's very small. Um, so it's better to kind of specify exactly what gems you want to update. So you, you can list one or more gems here in your bundle update line um, and just specifically target those gems that you want to update. Um, that will again update your gemfile.lock and uh, install uh, those newer versions. Uh, you can run bundle update by itself and like I said it will update every gem in your gem file. Uh, but that's a that's a quick way to get into a lot of trouble because not all gems are really vetted against one another, right? Not all gems necessarily work with the versions they say they work with, um, or maybe with your application code. So the whole integration issue becomes a problem if you bundle update 100 different gems. Um, so that's a great way to find gems that, that you need to get uh, up to date with. Um, this is the uh, command I started to explain just a little bit ago, is bundle clean. So once you've updated gems, you have those old gems still installed, and you now have new gems installed. Uh, and those take up a lot of space. So if you ever look at uh, your gem folder uh, where those are stored, you could have gigs and gigs of uh, gems laying around that you're not really using. Uh, so bundle clean is a great way to just go through and essentially RMRF all of those gems that you are no longer using. Um, let's see here. A uh, cool thing I learned preparing for this talk is you can visualize your gem dependency list as well with GraphViz and BundleViz. Um, so the simple Sinatra gem file that I created at the beginning, uh, this is its visualization. Sinatra uh, depends on tilt and rack and rack protection, um, and that's what your, your gem file looks like. Uh, I wanted to show a more complicated one here. anywhere. So bundle viz. We're going to open up this one. So that gem file I showed you just a little bit ago that had a bunch of different gems in it. Um, this is its dependency graph. Uh, again, I guess it's not super big here, kind of. Uh, you see all your top level gems across the top. Oh, I can't navigate around in here, can I? Oh, kind of. See so, um, uh, the top level gems that were defined and then all of their, de all their dependencies that spawn off of that. So SoapForce uses Savan, which is for SOAP APIs, and it has a ton of dependencies. Um, Kami is for REST APIs, it has a ton of dependencies. So it's neat to kind of see what, what's all using what within your, uh, within your bundled environment. Um, so that was a cool new trick that I just learned recently. Uh, if you're on a Mac, you have to first brew install GraphViz and then gem install GraphViz as well, uh, FYI. Uh, now we get to the fun parts. So bundle config. Uh, this is where we get a little more advanced. So in your, in your bundled environment, Bundler needs to keep track of things. So how does it do that? Um, it does that through a command called bundle config. Um, and you can see here I have a lot of things as I'm going to try to talk about these a little bit. Um, Bundle config is looking at two files, or uh, I guess maybe one of two files on your file system. Um, there is a hidden folder called .bundle, and then they have a file .config. Um, so let's talk about this here real briefly. Bundle config can be set at the local scope. If I have a project that I want local config for, I can set it there. Or if I want global config, so on my, on my entire MacBook, if I want a global bundle config where bundle runs the same everywhere I go, I can do that in the global config. Um, and then you have the option to delete those config items as well. So one of them is a path. 
if you guys aren't familiar with this when you do a bundle install your gems by default go to the the default ruby gems location so i can't remember if uh gem home where is it gem path so your your environment variable called gem path is where gems are going to go if you just blindly run bundle install it's going to go for me into rvm gems and then this ruby version or this this version of ruby uh, and and that will just fill up that folder there essentially if you want that to go somewhere else you specify a path so i can say bundle config path vendor vendor bundle and that will put it in a local folder um, to my project so that's typically how i do things i like to have my gems in a vendor folder in the actual folder that i'm in so that if i want to remove that directory remove the folder start over with my gems i just have to rmrf this local vendor folder and i'm not screwing up my global you know gem path where everything else is installed um, so if i do bundle path uh, bundle config path vendor bundle that sets it for for all bundle install commands from there on from there on out um, bundle config also has a couple uh, uh, not tricks, I guess, but uh, you can use some of the dash operators here. So you can say where I was showing you groups, I can say without production, and that will set my config to always install without my production gems if I'm just doing local dev testing for some reason. Um, if I always want bundle install to create bin stubs, then I would set my config to say bin true. And so every time you run bundle install, it would make those bin stubs as well. Um, so those files, uh, actually this is what I wanted to point out right here, two different files. One of them is gonna be in your home folder. So for me, it's, you know, it's users j heth uh, bundle config. This is my global bundle config path. Um, and you can see that it's basically just a set of key value pairs. Um, I also have a local bundle config here that have a different set of key value pairs, but they are locally scoped to this project only. Um, so just to dispel, I guess, hopefully that magic, right, there is a file somewhere on your system that's telling Bundler what to do, and you can, you can modify it. Um, yep, okay. Moving on from there, uh, build options. So this is something that I learned uh, the hard way, but I thought was really interesting. So there are some gems on your system um, that need to compile native headers. Have you ever gotten that error where you're trying to install Postgres or MySQL and it's compiling a native extension and it says, hey, I can't find these headers. I have no idea where they are. Um, well, one of the great options you can do here is uh, bundle config and you would say build dot gem name. And then what you can do is pass in these header flags that will get passed through the compilation step. So for example, I have, uh, when I do Postgres, I've installed Postgres using the Postgres app instead of brew, so my headers are in the wrong place or in a different place. Um, so all I have to tell Bundler is to say, hey, when you go to build the PG gem, um, I actually want you to use a different config file. Let's scroll over now. So I say with PG config, and I get to specify the exact path on my system where, where Postgres is installed. Um, oops. So that's really handy. handy. Same with MySQL, if that gets installed to a different place, uh, this build.prefix is kind of a magic thing to tell Bundler how to build that native extension. Let's see here, uh, local Git repository. So I showed you an example earlier where you would specify path to the local file, uh, but that can kind of be annoying if I'm always going into my gem file and I'm saying, oh, switch it to GitHub, switch it to local, switch it to GitHub, you know, or, or or you have two copies in there that you're always commenting in and out. Um, there's another special config item called local. So if you're doing local gem development, you can say bundle config local dot gem name, give it the path to that, and it will essentially kind of override or overlook what you have in your gem file. And it will say, okay, I'm not gonna look at GitHub, I'm gonna look at my config and pull it off the file system. Um, so that's a great way if you are a gem maintainer or a developer or you forked it, um, you can, uh, you can quickly set and unset your bundle config to look at that local, uh, that local path. So basically just by saying, hey, I want my local cami gem to go to this folder, and then you just click bundle, and it's gonna go pick up that local git shaw. Um, and then when you're done, you can say, hey, delete that local and bundle again um, so that it picks up the latest GitHub push that you hopefully just did. 
Um, there are some nuances around this as far as branch goes. Uh, using this local option wants you to specify a branch to kind of keep you sane so that you're working on the same branch you think you're working on. Um, so it will complain if you don't specify a branch, or there's actually an even more advanced option you can say that says, hey, don't, don't complain if I don't specify a branch. But I um, thought that was a really slick way to, to do local gem development. Um, the other thing Gem Bundler is great for is actually creating gems. So if you have never created a gem, um, we are going to do that right now. And you just say bundle gem, um, and we're gonna call ours Jimmy Mac. And so we have now a project structure uh, with everything we need for a gem, right? So this is, uh, you can see all the files here, hopefully, right? I have my gem file, I have a git ignore. Um, actually did this, uh, this should have already, this created a git repository for me. Um, so I can just say, hey, let's commit this. Uh, actually, before I do that, let's, um, uh, I can't remember. So the gem file here in a, in a gem, for a gem uh, actually just tells you to go to the gem spec file. Um, so this is a little bit different. Your gem file, you don't list them out here. Uh, you would go into your gem spec file uh, where you have your gem specification and all of your dependencies are gonna get added down here, right? So here's where you add uh, dependencies for the gem that you're working on. Um, uh, it's pretty, this thing keeps you pretty sane, so I actually need to install this, so I'm gonna bundle install. Uh, I'm gonna show you the option that I do here. I'm gonna say, hey, I wanna install this to a local vendor folder. And then it's a, it complains and it says, my gem spec's not right. So right off the bat, it's kinda helping you walk through the creation of a gem. So it does not like that uh, there are two do's in this gem file. Um, so I'm gonna just fill these out because so that it doesn't complain. To do. Uh, we'll give NDRB credit, except RG. Okay, so now I should be able to bundle install if my gem spec is valid. Again, it's going out, resolving dependencies, right? This is what you guys are always used to seeing here. And you can see at the very bottom, it has now installed these into dot vendor. So I have a local vendor folder here that has all of my rubies, uh, all my gems for this project. Again, it's just a folder. I can RMRF that whenever I want and do another bundle install if you ever screw up that folder. Um, everything's local. Uh, let's add my Jimmy Max spec and I'm going to git ignore. I'm going to git ignore my vendor folder. And I'm going to do my initial commit. Okay, so one of the cool things that Jim Bundler gives for you right out, of, right, right out of the box, and I guess I'm not sure if this is Jim Bundler or maybe just uh, if it's Bundler or just Jim's, but if I do uh, bundle exec rake dash T, uh, Jim Bundler is giving me rake tasks that I can use to, to develop my gem. So this is also a good just workflow pattern working with Jim Bundler. Um, you can see here that I now have options. Let me bring this back up a little bigger maybe. I have an option to build my gem. So when you uh, when I when you say bundle exec, I'm gonna actually shorten this. I have a shortcut be rake uh, build. Uh, it is essentially taking all of my gem files, the whole directory structure, and popping it into a gem. Um, a gem is really just a zip file or kind of a tar gzip. Uh, if you rename this, we can go open it in Finder and go look at all of my code. So there's nothing super special about the gem file. Um, it is special, but uh, it's, it's easy to go inspect. Um, let's get back to my rake list here. Um, so clean and clobber will you know, we'll get, get rid of anything that you have here. You can do some local testing with rake install. So this will essentially install it into your system. So if I said rake install, it will take my Jimmy Mac gem and install it into my, my gem list essentially so that I can go require it and use it somewhere else. Um, Bund uh, bundle rake rspec will run all of your specs. 
the really cool thing here is release. So release will actually take this gem, push it to GitHub, tag it, and then do a gem push, and it's live on Ruby gems. Um, so that's what we're going to try to do right here. Um, we're going to say release. It's going to complain because the very first thing it wants is, is a GitHub repository. It wants to help you stay sane and keep track of things. Um, so I'm going to try to go do this. I'm going to create a new gem out here called Jimmy Mac. And I want to be public. I'm going to add it as my remote uh, origin for this for this uh, repository. Hopefully you guys are familiar or somewhat familiar with Git. I'm um, just connecting this local Git repo with my remote Git repo. Um, let's see what it does now. It's going to fail again, I think, because I have not pushed anything, or I have not, uh, I guess it wants me to set my upstream master, which is fine. Okay, now we'll bundle exec release. So there's pushed it, it tagged it, uh, it pushed my tag, and then it failed to actually push the gem um, due to my gem spec here. Uh, so your your local my local Jimmy Mac gem spec actually has some uh, kind of validation so that you're not just pushing garbage or that you're not pushing inadvert inadvertently to Ruby gems. Um, so I think I actually didn't try this before today, so we're giving this a shot. I think if I comment that out. Complaining about this. Oh wait, no, that's not gonna work. Try it. All right. So we just published a gem to RubyGems.org called Jimmy Matt. Uh, that should be out there. If we want to go look at it. Yep, so there's our new gem that we just pushed with our GitHub show. The home page is going to take me to NDRB. Uh, and we now have a gem for other people to be able to bundle install. So if I went back over to my, uh, where did I go? Forget where I went. If I went back to my other gem file and said gem Jimmy Mac and bundled installed, it would pull that gem down and I'd now be able to use it. Um, so if you have done things the older way, like I was doing for a long time, where I would push to GitHub, I would push a tag, I would use the regular gem upload to manage things, you can now use these handy built-in features uh, that Gem Bundler and Rack give you. So we just created a fun gem. Uh, we talked about gem development. Uh, a couple of final things, I think as I'm wrapping up here, haven't been paying attention to time, but uh, some more advanced options with Bundler and some gotchas is when you have a bundled environment and you fork off a process, you call system, exec, backticks, whatever, that, that new process inherits all of your bundled environment. So if you're in run Ruby file trying to exec a script from another Ruby project, Ruby gem, it's going to inherit your gem bundler environment and you'll get all, all kinds of fun errors can't find gem, wrong version of the gem, can't find this script, whatever it might be. It's because it's looking at those environment variables that Bundler has set, and your environment always carries through to child processes. Um, so there are several ways to get around it. You, there's the with clean ENV, uh, with clean ENV as well here, uh, where you can uh, do brew install, obviously, if I want to bundle exec and have it actually pick up that bundle environment. Uh, or more recently, uh, they've added two new helper methods right out of the box that says, hey, just go clean, just go run this in a clean environment. Um, so this can really get you if you are in an environment like Heroku, um, where your bundled environment is always loaded and you wanted to run a background task with rescue or delay jobs but use something else, um, Bundler's environment can really, can really screw you up. 
Uh, last slide I think I have here. These are all the options available to you with bundle install. So you guys are running bundle or bundle I or bundle install every day most likely, but you probably didn't know about the 12 or so options that you can pass to bundle install. So if you want to use a different gem file other than just gem file, you can do that. Uh, you have your bin stubs that we talked about earlier if you want to install bin stubs. Uh, if you want to do parallel execution of your bundle install, you can specify the number of jobs to run. Um, and then there's a bunch of stuff dealing with local and remote uh, references. So if I want to use my local cache for installing gems, I can pass local. Um, if I'm doing a deployment, it's going to get rid of my test and development groups for me and act like a, a Heroku would when it's deploying your application. Um, Force is going to go out and force download all of your gems, even if you have them locally. Um, here, this bundle system, this is where I always install things to a local vendor folder, but if I want to actually force them into my system path, you can say, hey, bundle install it to my system. And then you have a bunch of other things with pruning and caching, um, where your Ruby gems might be, inst might be installed if they're not in a typical path. Uh, you're with and without that we talked about, that, that do groups. Uh, you can quiet the output if you don't want to see a bunch of output. Um, your bundle dash dash clean does both bundle install and bundle clean together. So on every install, it would also make sure it's removing anything that you don't need anymore. Um, and then a little tricky one here, I guess, if you're using JRuby, you can change the bin stubs that get created by using the shebang and say, hey, I want it to be user bin JRuby instead of Ruby. Um, and then this interesting thing, I'm not sure when you would use it, but bundle standalone will basically create a bundle, bundle setup RB for you that it loads locally and then doesn't actually run through bundle. It runs through this standalone predefined list of gems that you have available. Um, and that's it, so those are all the slides. Uh, do you guys have any questions? I might have burned through that a little faster than I thought, but, or, or I was slow. Yeah, or Miles, or? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, I would love if you covered those last two, with and without, because I've been bitten by that recently. Okay, yeah. Let's see here if I can do that with an actual real life example. Um, uh, where did I go? My bundle presentation, resources, okay. So my bundle, lit, bundle file here is the one I showed earlier in the example uh, with kind of a smattering of things. Oh, I forgot one other thing I wanted to talk about. Um, so this gem file has two groups, a test and a development group. And so what I can do here is say bundle, uh, and so by default, install is the, is the default for bundle. So I don't have to type out install every time. Um, with test and without test are essentially gonna modify that bundle config that tells you which, which gems to install. Um, so let's see if I can do without test. So right now I have 43 gems installed according to this number. And if I do without test, that should be a lower number, 34 gems. So Bundler will only look at those 34 when it goes to load your environment. So if I were to try to run bundle exec rspec right now, um, this should fail because it's not there. It didn't load it because I told it to load without my test group. So same with development. If I say, hey, don't load my development group, it, it, won't, it won't get required. It won't be included in your environment at runtime. So with, I feel like typically without is used. In a production environment, you're going to do without test and development. Uh, I don't know a particular case where you would say with, with some grouping. Right. Um, I was just saying, unless you have a production group that is only available in production, then maybe you want to install that as well locally. So then you would say with production. Yeah. So but yeah, that changes what actually gets required, right? So the gem files are still there in your file, uh, but according to my bundle config, uh, I've said, hey, I don't want, I don't want test. Um, and just an FYI, you can come in here and delete this, that key value and bundle, and now I have all my gems back. So again, don't be afraid of those config files. They're just key value pairs, essentially. Did that help? Yeah. Okay. 
Did you have some miles? Uh, have you or maybe has anyone run a, run a private Jenna server? Uh, I have, yeah. My previous server, I was running on Jenna. I have, yeah. My previous job, we did. Okay. Yeah. And we use that gem in a box, and it just hosts on an IP and port. Uh, you can actually do it right from your local file system. That's what I was going to try to show, but couldn't quite get working for some reason. Uh, so Ruby Gems, right, is the gem command, gem install, gem uninstall, whatever. There's actually a gem server that comes with it. So if you run gem server, it's going to host the gem server on your system uh, at localhost uh, 8808. Uh, and what it does is it looks to that local gem file, gem set, and it says, hey, here's all the gems that I have available um, that you could install. So this list of gems here, right, is the same list as if I were to just say gem list, right? That's the same set of gems. And the theory is this, that you would be able to go in here and say, hey, I want to pull multi-JSON from my local gem server here. So if I did a bundle, this is going to fail, but what you see here is it actually goes off and fetches the source. So it went and just described what do I have in my local gem server, what's that remote on Ruby gems, and try to install it. For some reason, it's not finding the actual .gem file, uh, but in theory, that, that should work. But, but yeah, we... I ran Jim in a box in my previous job because we were afraid of open source and uh, not open source, I should say, publicly hosted repositories. Um, and yeah, so you can just treat that as its own its own source. I guess is anybody else? I didn't want to steal anybody else's answer. Years ago, we, we primarily did it for managing like what's open source Kind of interesting thing is uh, the guy who maintains Psychic, my firm, uh, he runs a private gem server that he runs his special version of Psychic Pro off of. So you just get a, a basic off a line in your gem file and point to his server to get the special gem. Cool. Just out there. This is, I just ran the help file for gem server, in case you guys are curious, right? You can set the port and the gem dir. These are just the, these are the defaults that it's doing. It's looking at my default Ruby set and, and loading those up. Any other questions? So when you're doing the bundle open where you're sort of dynamically either debugging or maybe trying like a patch against the gem, or you're doing local development, or you're pointing to a local path. What um, do you need to like bounce your Rails server to pick up those changes? Do you need to bundle again? Is there like does Spring help you out there? I feel like I always fiddle when I'm in that situation. I sometimes I'm, I'm debugging and I'm like either I'm getting false positives or whatever, like because my changes are not getting actually picked up by my Rails app. So like, what's the magic formula for getting those? To yeah, I, I can't answer Spring. Unfortunately, we are not using Spring yet. But uh, if if you're not, you, I, you definitely have to bounce your server. So, so if, you if you're running, if you're already running Rails, say right, and uh, that's up and running, and you want to debug something in there, like it's Bundler's already done its job. It's already required all the files. It's going to only do that once. Um, it doesn't know that you've changed it, so you would need to bounce your Rails server in that case. Uh, I don't know what happens with Spring. May, I doubt that Spring is watching your dependencies. It's probably watching your stuff. But yeah, I don't know if it actively monitors your dependency files. And is there any way if you're if you've gone down some rabbit hole with with uh, bundle open and you mm -hmm. want to sort of reset back to whatever the whatever the gem is actually like? Is there a command like a rape command you can do, or you kind of you know, like remove the gem and reinstall it? Yep, yep. So I, I've run into that several times, um, and I feel like I don't quite know the magic steps yet. So you can get, you know, as we showed, you can get, uh, you can get the, you can get the path to that gem. Um, bundle pristine that gem name. Then it will. Is it pristine? Reset it. Oh, okay. To its local. 
Uh, I do. There was like a bundle gem uninstall command that you could run or that I've seen run. It seems like it seemed like that was hit or miss if it would work all the time. You can also cd into the directory, git init, turn it into a little git repo, make a branch, and fill it all the way when you're done. Yeah. Mm. Never actually push it out of your Let me see if I can do the uninstall rack. No. Yeah, so that has tripped me up before. That's a good one. Those Rails will auto load and require files that are in your gem file on boot up, so you have to you would have to stop and restart that server every time. However, you could add require false in your gem file and require it dynamically in wherever code you're using. If if that's an appropriate situation, like you're, I'm doing lots of rapid uh, iteration on this. Sorry. Cool. Anything else? So, uh, this made me feel real smart, so I was here and I, I went bundle clean, and it, it says cleaning all the gems in your system is dangerous. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's probably your, 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 it's probably using your default path in, it's using your system path, and so yeah, it's warning you, hey, you're, you're, whatever project you might be in, you're actually cleaning up the system. Does that make sense? So you might have a yeah. bunch of you might have a bunch of projects that are all being installed into the system level, and what it's going to do. So this is dangerous because it's going to only look at the gem file that you have right now, and it will clean up everything that's not in that gem file. So when you move over to your other project, those gems will be gone. So uh, I don't run into that issue because it because I install locally all the time. I always yeah. have a local path that it looks at, and so I'm only hurting that local project. So yes, it will warn you. Does it let you, I think it lets you bundle clean force if you want to clean, but it probably is a bad idea to run clean if your gems are all stored at the system level. Well, maybe not, I guess it depends on your setup. Well, that's true, yeah. So yeah, I guess the worst thing that would happen is that you would have to bundle install in some other project. Well, the worst thing that would happen is that somebody had yanked a gem or uh, you are using a GitHub source that doesn't exist anymore. That's, I guess that's true. In another project. Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah. So since Bundler is a gem, would it clean out Bundler as well? <laughs> no, it does not. So Bundler is not a gem that you ever put in your gem file. Okay. Bundler is one of those system level gems, um, and it does know to, to not clean itself up. <laughs> yes. Good question. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. Do you have a, like, a favorite Bundler feature? I think, I think after learning about outdated and clean, I think those are probably my favorite, right? Because I know after working on a project for a while that we're definitely minor version behinds or major versions behind of things. And uh, instead of manually having to go look at, you know, guess which gems need updated, uh, it's great to just bundle outdated, bundle update, bundle clean. So. I will admit that when you started demoing outdated, I over here probably with my laptop for the current, my current client. Their project ran bundle outdated and piped everything to a text file, yep. and then closed my laptop. Here, I closed my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I, I don't know if you saw my tagline on that slide. I probably went by it too quick, but uh, like right, this command can cause a lot of sadness because you just realize you realize how behind you really are, and then you try to feel better about updating some development dependencies, and then yeah, you move on, right? So. Well, um, where I'm at right now, they tried, they tried to, like, every time we tried to stay on the very latest version of Rails all times, mm -hmm. and so every time even a minor version comes out, there's a, a, a story in our project management thing, a uh, task essentially that pops up that, all right, type an update, and usually the description says, while you're at it, just run bundle update. Let's just do this thing. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> Let's just do it. <laughs> Gems that just absolutely would not work well together. And so that now it's my fault. I was like, listen, this is ridiculous. Like, forget it. Leave it there. It's minor, minor versions behind. Leave those minor versions behind. And we'll just keep, we'll make go to that. And we'll revisit that later. Um, but then you have to revisit that later. So 
so. <laughs> yeah. 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 Long list of outdated gems that all need revisited, so that'd be fun. Yeah. Is, is there any magic command or maybe a project that will, like, the outdated thing is cool or clean, like I'm not using it, but like, what if you give a long-running Rails project, you've gone through, you know, several refactorings, and there's gems that you're no longer using in your code base. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, they're in my gem pile. Like, is there any command that would help you, like, identify, like, I could just take this gem out, like. Oh, so gems that are listed like but not actually list. used? Oh, I don't know about that one. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, I have not seen anything about that. It'd be a tough project just because no, you have dynamics, the dynamic, uh, like, metaprogramming ability of Rails and Ruby. Let me throw in one more thing real quick. Sorry, I just remembered this uh, kind of interesting thing. When I went to install, I wanted Nokogiri to be an example because that's uh, a gem we use a ton. Um, I went to install it from its GitHub location and it just hard failed, right? It said, uh, let me remove this version and see if it'll update here. So it's going to go out to Nokogiri GitHub, right? Uh, actually, it might fail on my local host thing real quick. Let's see what happens. Ah, my lock file's messed up. What I learned is that Nokogiri gem does not have a gem spec file. You can't load it from its GitHub repository as a, as a trick, as a method. Nokogiri doesn't want you to load it from GitHub. They do a ton of active development on their master branch, and they don't want anybody actually using their master branch as an actual gem. So they have a whole wiki write-up of why we don't have a gem spec, and they force you to essentially get it from Ruby gems, right? The, the, where the gem has been vetted and appropriately published. Because um, I'm sure all of you guys, you, you find a gem version that's out there, it doesn't have that latest patch, so you go pull it from GitHub, and now you're tracking off of somebody's source tree that you know could be tested or not. So I thought it was interesting that as a project, as a team, they've decided to, to kind of not let people do that. Except Bundler lets you get around that. <laughs> if you specify a version, Bundler makes you specify a, a version, any version, even if it doesn't exist. Um, and then it will pull it and tag it with that version and then compare all of your other project dependencies against that version. So I thought that was a, a, a little tricky thing that Nokogiri was doing and that Bundler still allows you to do. Okay. I don't know. Right. <laughs>